Many different mysterious events have taken place in the past that we struggle to understand, such as people who have gone missing never to be seen again, locations that are reported by hundreds of people to be haunted, or murders that have gone unsolved for decades with very little hope of ever being solved. While many theories have been put forward in an effort to solve these cases, they remain unexplained as they continue to baffle investigators and experts alike. Number 10. In April of 2005, 44-year-old Wendy Marie DeHoop was working for Georgia Pacific Mill in Hasley, Oregon. She and her husband Dan were living in Cottage Grove, and on the morning of the 22nd of that year, the couple got ready for work as they would on any other day. But the day would turn out very differently, as Wendy would go missing, never to be seen by her husband again. The couple left their house early that morning since Dan had to start his shift at Home Depot at 7 a.m. They drove to his workplace, which was located at the 1000 block of Green Acres Road, and Wendy dropped him off before traveling 30 miles to her own workplace. But she never showed up for her shift, which her boss found very strange. And when she remained missing the following day, both Dan and her boss reported her as missing to the police. Almost a week later, a man walking his dog came across Wendy's purse, which was lying on the ground, and he turned it into employees at the Bymark store in Eugene. When the purse's contents were checked, it was found that Wendy's wallet was missing, and it was immediately speculated that she might have been the victim of a robbery. The same man who'd found her purse would make yet another discovery when he came across her 1990 Toyota Corolla SR5, where it had been abandoned on the Lorraine Highway in South Eugene. Unfortunately, Wendy wasn't with the vehicle. In order to search it properly, the vehicle was impounded by the authorities, who then took it to the Oregon State Police Crime Lab, which is located in Springfield. The car was thoroughly searched and processed, but offered up no further clues as to what may have happened to Wendy. There was no sign of a struggle that had taken place inside the car, but since Wendy wasn't found, there was still a major cause for concern since two other women, Helen Orderman Pratt, and Rebecca Lynn Hess had vanished in the area in the month before Wendy disappeared. Investigators considered the idea that Wendy may have simply decided to disappear of her own volition. But since her car had been abandoned and her purse was found lying by the side of the road, this seemed very unlikely. But they also stated that they found no evidence to believe that she'd been a victim of foul play, since the car didn't show any evidence that she'd been held against her will or that a struggle had taken place at any point. Wendy is described as having black hair and brown eyes. She stands 5 foot 6 inches tall and at the time that she went missing, weighed between 145 and 155 pounds. The last time that she was seen was by Dan and she was wearing a suit with black pinstripe pants and Dan believes she may have been wearing a silver ring with a diamond cut design on her left ring finger. It should also be noted that Wendy's belly button was pierced. She has circular marks on her back a C-section scar on her abdomen, and several scars on her left arm and leg. She's also known to wear contact lenses. Wendy's case remains open, and investigators have asked anyone who sees her, or who has information that may lead to her case being closed, contact the Lane County Sheriff's Office at 541-682-4311. Wendy's name is case numbers MP875. Number 9. Dietrich Julian Foster has been missing from Independence in Kansas since the 12th of April 2020, when he was 37 years old and due to the evidence that was gathered in his case, investigators believe he may have been the victim of foul play. At the time, Dietrich had just started in a new position at FedEx, having previously worked as a corrections officer and a security officer for a private company. He was known to be very close with his family, especially his two daughters though he was no longer married as he and his wife had gotten divorced. Dietrich was in the habit of using prepaid phones until they were shut off, after which he would simply buy a new one. On the 4th of April, he called his ex-wife and told her that his phone would be shut off again soon, but that he would be in touch as soon as he bought a new one. Following this, he remained unusually quiet, and his family became concerned since he never went very long without getting in touch. When he failed to call his mother for Mother's Day, they became even more worried since this had never happened before. There was no way for anyone to get in touch with Dietrich since his phone had been shut off. And so when he still remained silent by the 12th of May, 
his family decided to file a missing person report with the Independence Police Department. They informed the police that he always kept in touch and that they were worried something untoward may have happened to him. Concerns only grew when Dietrich failed to attend a celebration for his and his twin sister's birthday. And furthermore, he didn't contact his daughters for either of their birthdays. When Father's Day came around and Dietrich still hadn't contacted his daughters, his family's fears were escalated. A few of his friends would contact the authorities in April to state that they'd seen him in Independence after he went missing, but none of these reports ever went anywhere. Investigators later told the family that they'd found evidence that led them to believe that Dietrich's life had been ended, but this information has never been released to the public. As a result, a $5,000 reward is being offered to anyone who comes forward with information, leading to Dietrich's case being solved, and the person or people responsible for his disappearance being apprehended. Dietrich is described as having black hair and brown eyes. He stands between 5'9 and 5'11 and weighs between 180 and 190 pounds. He can also be identified by a scar on his chest, the result of heart surgery that he had in the past, as well as a scar on his nose. Furthermore, he has several distinctive tattoos, the first being of a cross on his right forearm, the second being the zodiac sign for Gemini on his right arm. He has another tattoo of three dice on his left arm, a name tattooed on his arm, and the word Fu on his abdomen. If you or anyone you know happens to know where Dietrich is or who may be responsible for his disappearance, you're urged to contact the Independence Police Department at 620-332-1700. Alternatively, you can get in contact with the Kansas Bureau of Investigation at 785-296-4017 with any information you have. Dietrich's NamUs case number is MP70553. Number 8. It's often the case that when someone becomes successful in the business sector, they start making enemies since their competitors work equally as hard to make money, and when they fall behind, they may become resentful. According to those who knew Barry Sherman, the founder of a pharmaceutical company called Apotex Inc., this was certainly the case since the pharmaceutical industry is known to be a very competitive one. Barry started his road to success when he became the owner of Empire Laboratories. The business originally belonged to his uncle, but when he passed away, Barry inherited the already established company. But in order to found his own company, he sold Empire Laboratories after just a few years. And by 2017, he'd become a very rich man as he employed as many as 10,000 staff and was making around $1.5 billion every year. Barry and his wife Anna, better known as Honey, were known to be caring people who often contributed to their community as they supported hospitals, community centers, and colleges in Toronto. One of his biggest donations ever, a total of $50 million, was made to the United Jewish Appeal, and before long the couple had become well known in the political arena and the business sector. But as the business grew, Barry was accused of inflating prices, and since he was affiliated with the Liberal Party, people became concerned that he may be operating under a conflict of interest. He was also known to be rather litigious, and hence lost a lot of friends and gained a lot of enemies on his way to the top. Some of his family members stated that he wasn't really the kind-hearted philanthropist that he portrayed, and that he only cared about putting more money in his own pockets. Carrie Winter, Barry's cousin, stated that he often fantasized about ending Barry's life but never followed through on those thoughts. He even revealed that Barry had hired him years earlier to end Honey's life, though this has never been proven as he claimed that Barry eventually called the hit off. Barry once speculated that someone may one day end his life thanks to his business dealings, and it seems that in 2017 his prediction may have come true. On the 13th of December of that year, Barry and Honey had a meeting with the builder who would ultimately be the last person to see them alive. They'd been planning to sell their house, and the following day, Barry didn't show up for work, something that was completely out of character. Two days later, an estate agent would make a horrific discovery. Having traveled to their home to show it to clients, the agent took the clients down to the house's basement to show them the indoor pool. And here, they found Barry and Honey where their lives had been ended, with belts around their necks. Honey's cell phone was found in the bathroom, suggesting she'd tried to hide there before being found. Investigators found no sign that someone had broken into the house. All the doors and windows were locked, 
and hence it was assumed that Barry had ended Honey's life before taking his own. But the coroner's report stated that this was a homicide case. A strange figure was caught by CCTV cameras outside the couple's house, but they've never been identified, and it's uncertain whether they were involved in the crime. People immediately started speculating that the couple had been killed by someone in the pharmaceutical industry, or by one of their family members, but the case has never been solved and remains under investigation. Number 7 26-year-old Risha Lewis has not been seen since the 21st of January, 2006, after she inexplicably disappeared from Elkton in Maryland, and her case remains a mystery as her whereabouts remain unknown. Risha hailed from Newcastle, Delaware, where she resided in the 400 block of Morehouse Drive. She traveled to Elkton on the 20th of January, something that she did on weekends since she had a friend who lived in the area. She arrived there, and at about 1.30 p.m. the next day, she contacted her family back home to inform them that she was about to start heading back. She then drove away from her friend's house, never to be seen or heard from again. When Risha failed to show up at home, her family tried to contact her, but all efforts went unanswered. She was then reported as missing, and during these ensuing investigations, her cell phone was monitored. Strangely, it remained activated, but was never used again. For the nine months of the investigation, the police were at a loss as no sign of Risha was found, but on the 17th of October of that year, Risha's white 1997 Crown Victoria was found in Newark, Delaware, about 14 miles from her house. The area around the car was thoroughly searched, but since it had likely been there for some time, no additional clues were found. The inside of the car was also searched, but all of these efforts proved fruitless. There have been no additional sightings of Risha, and investigators remain baffled as to what may have happened to her. Her family still holds out hope that she will eventually be found, and in an effort to help identify her, they've released a description of her. Risha has black hair and brown eyes. She stands 5 foot 3 inches tall, and at the time she disappeared weighed 130 pounds. She has a pierced eyebrow and a scar on her abdomen from a C-section. She also has several tattoos that may be useful in identifying her if she's spotted. The name Kev is tattooed on her upper arm, along with a set of flames. She also has her own name, Risha, tattooed on one of her wrists, and the name Jamie on her calf. Furthermore, she has a tattoo of a butterfly on her chest, and either barbed wire or vines on her bag. She was last seen at her friend's house in Elkton and at the time, she was known to be wearing several pieces of jewelry, including a gold rope necklace and a gold rope bracelet. The necklace also contained a pendant with the phrase, Mommy and Me. It's now been eight years since Risha went missing, but her case is still being investigated. If you've seen her or know where she may be, you're asked to contact the Newcastle Police Department at 302-395-8171. Risha's NamUs case number is MP2261. Number 6. The George Hotel in Pilgrim's Inn first opened its doors in Glastonbury, England in 1475, according to most sources, and it became so well known that it was even visited by King Henry VII. At the time, it was seen as an exclusive hotel, since only the wealthy could afford to stay there. After the hotel was constructed, the decision was made to build an inn that could accommodate pilgrims who were traveling through the area at a time when the War of Roses was raging and the inn is still a prominent feature of Glastonbury Abbey today. But while the hotel still amazes its visitors with its ornate decorations and architecture, it has a darker side that several people have seen. It's rumored that the three-story building is haunted a rumor that's helped along by the fact that the atmosphere inside is very reminiscent of medieval times. It's said that King Henry VIII also stayed at the hotel, specifically in a room on the second floor from where he watched as the abbey was raised to the ground after he'd ordered this to be done. But there's an element of doubt about this theory, since he had by this point become so overweight that he could barely walk under his own steam, and therefore would likely have opted for a room on the ground floor rather than take on the stairs leading to what's now known as the Henry VIII Room. As for the spirits that are said to be present in the hotel, the first is that of a monk who's been seen wandering through the hallways. He's usually spotted early in the morning before the hotel gets busy, and several guests have reported hearing the floorboards creak as he passes by. 
On some occasions, he's seen in the company of a graceful woman who follows close behind him, and it's said that she always has a look of yearning on her face, though it isn't known who she was when she was still alive. One guest who visited the hotel during the 1970s claimed to have had a very close encounter with the monk. The woman had gone up to her room for the night when the monk suddenly appeared as if out of nowhere while she was lying in bed. The monk then walked over to the bed and sat down, causing the sheets to tighten around her as she did so. He remained in the room for about 15 minutes, according to the guest, but he wasn't alone. She stated that there were two other figures with him, though she couldn't identify them since they appeared as a strange kind of mist that hovered behind him. A medium who investigated the hotel stated that he believed the monk and the woman were in a relationship, but since the monk was supposed to be celibate, they never became intimate and are now endlessly fated to dwell the halls of the hotel together, with the woman forever pining after the monk. Other guests have reported seeing the visage of a tall man in a blue jacket on occasion, and at times they've heard the sounds of voices arguing or music coming from unoccupied rooms. There have also been reports of the smell of cigar smoke in some areas, and in some of the rooms the lights or televisions will suddenly turn on and off without explanation. In the cellar, people have heard the sound of disembodied footsteps, seen doors slamming when no one is near them, and on occasion the sound of someone coughing can be heard. There have also been sightings of a second monk who said to have passed away in one of the rooms, which has now been given the name The Haunted Cell. Number 5. In most missing person cases, it's quickly discovered that the victim has disappeared and a missing person case is opened with the nearest police department. But this wasn't the case when 26-year-old Nuseba Hassan, a Jordanian-Canadian reporter, vanished without a trace. Nuseba went missing in 2006, but it wouldn't be until nine years later that her case was investigated when she was finally reported as missing. At the time, she was known to be living with her boyfriend in Hamilton, Ontario, while her family resided on a property in Millgrove. The last time she was seen was when one of her family members gave her a ride from Hamilton back to her family's house, and after that she mysteriously disappeared and was never seen again. It isn't known whether she was dropped off at the property by the family member or not, and if not, why this wasn't done. If this was the case, she surely would not have gone missing but these details have not been released to the public. Nine years later, one of Nuseba's sisters, Sarah, decided to file a police report in an effort to find her, and it isn't known why this wasn't done immediately after she went missing. Surely, if an investigation took place at the time, her case may have been solved by now, and since so much time has passed, any clues that were present will now have been destroyed. During an interview, Sarah stated that Nuseba was in the habit of staying away from home for prolonged periods when she was a teenager, but added that she would always eventually come home. She was then asked why the family waited for nine years before opening a case with the police, and she replied that they were used to her being gone from home for extended periods, and that they simply hadn't noticed she was missing. But strangely, she stated that she thinks about her sister every day when she goes to bed and when she wakes up. Investigators are speculating that Nuseba's life was likely ended on the day that she went missing, but Sarah refuses to believe this as she's hopeful that her sister is still alive and happy wherever she may be. The property where the family lived was extensively searched with the use of drones, search dogs, and ground-penetrating radar, but these efforts have proved fruitless so far. These searches were conducted after the property was sold, and most of the family now resides in Jordan many of whom have been uncooperative with the investigation for reasons unknown. It is known that Nuseba and her father, Moses, didn't have the best relationship, and on one occasion, she filed a report with the Children's Aid Society, after which she was taken into foster care, but returned home two months later. There are reports that when Moses was on his deathbed, one of his children came to him to confess that they'd ended Nuseba's life in order to save the family's honor since she refused to obey her father's rules such as wearing a hijab at all times. The resulting investigation found no traces of Nuseba after 2006, and hence it's assumed that she is no longer alive, but only time will tell if this strange and complicated mystery will ever be solved, and whether the person responsible will ever be brought to justice. 
Number 4. Usually, when a ship is in peril, its crew will send out a distress signal in hopes that nearby ships will hear it and come to the vessel's aid. In some cases, the distress signal is responsible for the crew being rescued, but other cases end more tragically, with the ship ending at the bottom of the ocean. In even stranger cases, the ship and its crew are never seen again. But the case of the Xian Seng doesn't conform to any of these scenarios. In fact, the ship's very existence only became apparent when it was first spotted floating aimlessly off the coast of Queensland, Australia, specifically in the Gulf of Carpentaria. When the ship was first spotted, it was reported to customs officers who then made their way out into the ocean, but they were faced with many questions, some of which still remain unanswered. While they were able to identify the 260-foot ship's name after boarding it, they couldn't figure out who it belonged to or where it had sailed from before seemingly being abandoned. They were also unable to find out what country it was registered in. Upon boarding the vessel, they found that a broken tow rope was hanging from its bow. They went to the deck below and found no signs of life, leading them to believe the ship had at some point been inoperable and was being towed to an unknown location before being lost at sea. It's been speculated that when the towing rope broke, the decision was made to simply abandon the ship, and it then drifted for an unknown amount of time before being spotted near Australia. During an investigation, it was found that the ship had been abandoned for some time, since no signs were found that any human activity had taken place on board for quite a while. The possibility that the vessel had been used in a smuggling operation was also ruled out, but the vexing question of where the ship came from still lingered. There was no indication that the ship had run into trouble, and it seems likely that the crew made their way off the ship in a calm and timely manner. But there was one clue. The ship contained a large amount of rice, leading investigators to speculate that it was used to resupply fishing boats that were operating outside of Australia's exclusive economic zone. Once the ship had been thoroughly searched, a tugboat was sent to bring it back to shore in Wepa. A customs officer told a media outlet that it's virtually impossible to locate the ship's country of origin, since it contains very few markings, none of which have been helpful. None of the crew's documentation was found on board, and by the condition of the ship, it seems likely that it had been stripped of parts before being abandoned. It is entirely possible that the ship was never registered, and hence its country of origin may never be found. While the Zhan Seng was labeled as a ghost ship, it bears very little resemblance to the best known of these, the Flying Dutchman and the Mary Celeste. The resulting investigation couldn't identify the owner, and as a result, it was towed into deep water in April of 2006, where it was finally scuppered, taking its secrets with it to the bottom of the ocean. Number 3. The Great Salt Lake is situated in the state of Utah and is considered to be the largest saltwater lake in all of the Western Hemisphere. But it isn't only known for its enormity, since many myths and legends have emerged about the lake over the years, some of which are rather outlandish. One of the most famous stories in Salt Lake County concerns a man named Jean Baptiste, who is said to have robbed as many as 300 graves in the area in the mid-1800s. He pilfered the graves for jewelry, clothes, and anything that he thought was of value, but he was soon caught. He was eventually exiled to Fremont Island instead of being executed, and not much is known about his existence after that. It's known that he survived on the island for at least six weeks, but it's thought that he then constructed a raft out of wood and cow's hide and escaped his exile, though this has never been confirmed. But this is without a doubt the tamest of the lake's tales. In 1877, a man named J. H. McNeil, along with multiple employees of the Barnes & Co. Salt Works Company, was standing beside the lake when they spotted something truly strange near the North Shore. Some sources state that the incident took place at dusk, while others claim it happened at dawn, but whatever the case may be, the group of men were astonished when they spotted a massive animal with the body of a crocodile and the head of a horse swimming in the water. As soon as they spotted it, the creature let out a loud bellow and charged at them where they stood on the shore. They took flight up a nearby embankment and hid in the bushes until sunrise the next morning. The creature is now known as the North Shore Monster, though some people believe that this was merely a case of mistaken identity, as they believe the men actually saw a buffalo waiting in the water. But it isn't the only strange creature rumored to live in the lake. 
In 1847, or thereabout, a man called Brother Bainbridge reported seeing an animal akin to a dolphin swimming in the lake. And since a dolphin could never survive such high salinity levels, it was rumored to be yet another unidentified monster. Added to this are reports that the lake contains sections of underwater quicksand. One man reported in 1939 that he lost six of his horses to the quicksand after they seemingly wandered off course and into the water. But several studies have been conducted, none of which found any evidence that quicksand is present in the lake. There have also been reports of massive water spouts that appear over the lake on occasion. Then there are the tales of huge whirlpools that open up without warning. One man reported that while he was aboard a schooner on one occasion, the vessel encountered one of these whirlpools and was likely able to make it out to sea without being pulled under. Many people feel that the whirlpools don't really exist and that the witnesses who reported them had actually encountered water spouts. They didn't know what the spouts were and so called them whirlpools instead. Whether the North Shore monster really exists is up for debate as is the existence of the strange dolphin-like creature that was seen there. But to many people, the Great Salt Lake remains a mysterious place with even more mysterious legends. Number 2. 31-year-old William Smolinski, better known to his friends and family as Billy, mysteriously vanished on the 24th of August 2004 from his hometown in Waterbury in Connecticut, and his fate remains unknown. On the day that he disappeared, Billy was last seen at around 3.30 p.m. by his neighbor, who later reported that he'd come over to his place to ask if he could look after his dog, a German Shepherd named Harley, while he traveled up north to look at a car that was up for sale. The neighbor agreed and Billy set off, leaving Harley inside his home. The following morning, his neighbor went to his house to feed the dog, but found that all the doors were locked, and he found it strange that Billy's pickup was still sitting in the house's driveway. He immediately contacted the police, who then searched the truck, and inside they found his keys and wallet where they'd been hidden under the driver's seat. Billy's ex-girlfriend, Madeline Gleason, told the police that she'd seen him at about 4 a.m. on the day that he went missing. She told them that Billy had recently ended their relationship since he was convinced that she was seeing another man, Chris Sorensen. After speaking for a while, Billy left but seemed to be depressed. When his phone records were checked, it was found that he'd made three calls to Sorensen, who told investigators that he'd received a message on the 24th of August from an unknown man, later found to be Billy, who warned him to watch his back. He'd also made another call to another of his ex-girlfriends, in which he invited her to accompany him to Six Flags the following weekend. Inside Billy's house, police officers found a receipt showing that he visited a Burger King restaurant at around 3 p.m. His bank records were checked and it was found that he deposited his last paycheck, but had not accessed the account since he disappeared. Two years later, investigators received information that Billy had assaulted Madeline, and in retaliation her son, Sean Karpiak, had ended his life. The tipster claimed that Karpiak and another man, Jason Lee, then disposed of his body by burying him at one of Karpiak's work sites. The grave was then reportedly covered with concrete, but this information could not be followed up on, since Karpiak passed away in 2005. Two years later, Chad Hansen claimed to have knowledge of the location where Billy was buried, but he was later charged with interfering with the police investigation after the site was searched and nothing was found. He was sent to prison for four and a half years. The case has seen many twists and turns over the years, one of which occurred when Madeline sued Billy's family, claiming that they'd accused her of being involved with his disappearance and that she knew what happened to him. She won the case and was awarded a total of $52,000, though this ruling was later overturned by the Supreme Court, and Madeline eventually withdrew the case. Very little progress has been made in the case since then, and while Hansen and Karpiak are still considered people of interest, there's no way of proving that Billy was a victim of foul play though investigators feel that it is likely. Billy is described as having brown hair and blue eyes, weighing 200 pounds and standing 6 feet tall. He would be 51 years old today. His family told the police that he has a tattoo of a blue cross and the name Pruitt on his left arm, with another blue cross on his right shoulder. At the time of his disappearance, he wore a diamond stud in his left ear. If you have any information on Billy's case, 
you're asked to contact the Waterbury Police Department at 203-574-6941 or the New Haven FBI Office at 203-777-6311. Number 1. When 18-year-old Ebby Stepek suddenly disappeared from Little Rock, Arkansas in 2015, she made headlines all over the U.S. She was found deceased three years later, and nine years after she disappeared, the case remains unsolved. What is known about Ebby's last movements is that she attended a party on the 23rd of October without permission from her parents. According to text messages that she sent to her stepfather, Michael, she was assaulted by three men while at the party, and when she found out that one of them had recorded the assault, she threatened to go to the police. The following day, she spent some time at her grandmother's house, mostly lying in bed and watching cartoons. She had dinner at their house, after which they visited a TCBY store where they had frozen yogurt. Her cell phone records would show that she called the Little Rock Police Department at around 7.30 p.m. on the 25th of October, but they would later state that they had no record of these calls taking place, despite records showing that each of the calls lasted for about a minute. Ebby then spoke to Michael about the assault that had taken place, and they agreed that she should go to the police. They agreed to meet up later to go to the police station together. She then told her grandparents of their plans, but when her family tried to get in touch with her later, the calls went unanswered. Her brother Trevor managed to get in contact with her, but he told the police that she sounded strange and couldn't tell him who she was with. Bizarrely, she told him that she was sitting in her car in front of his house, but when he went outside, there was no one there. He managed to call her back, and she then told him that she didn't know where she was. This was the last time that anyone spoke to Ebby. Following her disappearance, Ebby's family and friends did everything they could to find her, but to no avail. When her family traveled to the police station to file a missing person report, they were erroneously told that they needed to wait 12 hours before reporting someone missing and three days later, her car was found in Chalamont Park next to a wooded area. The park was searched by investigators, but nothing was found, and in an effort to gain more information, a $50,000 reward was announced. Since then, Ebby's family has accused the Little Rock Police Department of mishandling the case, as they seemingly took their time to interview witnesses and review CCTV footage of a Walmart that she was known to have visited. The case went cold for two years until Ebby's remains were found in the very park that had been searched earlier, drawing more ire towards the police from her family and the community. She was found inside a drainage pipe, which in 2015 had been reported by her friends as emitting a foul odor. When officers arrived at the scene, they seemed disinterested and told their friends that their dogs would have picked up the smell of human decomposition and that the smell was likely caused by a decomposing animal. No one has ever been named as a person of interest in Ebby's case, and many people feel that her murder could have been solved had the Little Rock police acted appropriately. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.